How are we all doing tonight? People, just good? There we go. That's what I like to hear. We got a full house. We're in the castle. No. On behalf of Hammock Castle Museum, I just want to say thank you for coming out tonight for this evening's lecture. Number two in our Gloucester 400 plus series detailing some of the various tidbits of local lore and wisdom and history that we're going to present to you here today. Um, my name is Jim. I am the special events manager here at Hammond Castle Museum. Um, everything is going to be recorded tonight and for the rest of the lecture series. So you can definitely go ahead and catch all the highlights and uh, share them with your friends, your neighbors, your frenemies, all those folks. So glad to go ahead and and make that available to you as well. And these will be archived to ensure that for the future, generations yet unborn will be able to go ahead and see what we were doing here 400 plus years in to our Gloucester experiment. Anyhow, for those of you who are here tonight, you're in for a treat. If you've never attended a talk by Leslie Bartlett, you're about to experience a force of nature. Uh, less as a man, I had a great fortune to work with a year ago on the Rockport Art Association Museum's uh, 100th anniversary book. Les is, well, Les is the bomb. He's the man. Just a few things about Les for those of you who are not familiar with him. Leslie Bartlett is originally from Epsom, New Hampshire. He grew up in the house his father built, his childhood spent roaming over the 300 acres of a 400-year-old farm. A Greek and Latin major at Amherst College, he left this intellectual pursuit after two years and spent his adult life on stage at the Cabot Theatre Beverly Mass with Le Grand David and his own Spectacular Magic Company, which I'm very proud to say in the sixth grade I attended and I saw that. So, he did a great show, Les. Yeah. Um, he performed nine times at the White House with the Magic Troupe. He has lived on Cape Ann for nearly 50 years. A lifetime member of the Sandy Bay Historical Society and Museum in Rockport, he has offered numerous talks on Cape Ann history. He has lectured for 25 years on the Little Fish Shack float which charmed Chicago, the 1933 American Legion float, keeping this astonishing history alive. His fine art photography of granite quarries on Cape Ann was featured in the main gallery of the Cape Ann Museum on October 2007 through January of 2008. From Cape Ann, he traveled to Barry, Vermont in 2008 and created a master project based on the lives of the granite sculptors in the 19th century through the 20th. Give Me Your Hands, the legacy of the Barry Stone sculptors and their stone, received a primary featured installation at Michigan State University Law School in 2011. He has shown his works at the Vermont State House, the Vermont Granite Museum, and was guest photographer at Soho Photo in New York. His research on the lives of the stone workers throughout New England forms the basis of his forthcoming title, Break Stone, Water, Heart, and the Culture of Cape Ann Granite. In 2015, he installed Ecclesia, a 9 foot by 30 foot image from a quarry wall in Rockport. For the past seven years, the original print of Ecclesia has traveled throughout New England. Dogtown and Dogtown's artifacts have occupied much of his thinking over the past five years. In September of 2002, Les participated in the Jonathan Bayless Society Celebrating Dogtown Common, a special place. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Jonathan Bayless Society, I offer our sincere thanks for your work to create the wonderful Dogtown exhibit and for your insightful talks. This is a quote from Jonathan Bayless Society's uh, Secretary, David P. Bowditch. I offer our sincere thanks for your work to create the wonderful Dogtown exhibit and insightful talks. I personally heard from several conference attendees that their visit to the Sandy Bay Historical Society was a highlight of the weekend. They each mentioned how much they had learned from your talk and recommended it to others. So like I said, there's no one better qualified to give us this talk tonight. And so, without further ado, we open the floor to Leslie Bartlett. I very much want to thank Jim Hammond Castle. Especially want to thank Ruth Pino for the sponsorship of this program. Uh, also the sponsors Mass Cultural Council, Gloucester Cultural Council, and also to Rebecca Reynolds from Manship for loaning this wonderful screen. Um, 
Look, this is going to be a journey tonight. Everything I'm going to share with you about what I know of Dogtown has occurred over the past five years. Before five years ago, when I first moved to Cape Ann 50 years ago, I went blueberry. But blueberrying was based on what it was like when I grew up a kid in Epsom, New Hampshire. And it was really clear. The men picked high bush. The women, mostly my aunt, picked low bush. And that was the way that it went. And the blueberries were in a swamp. And my only knowledge of Dogtown was to go and find where the high bush blueberries were. So this is not a talk about blueberrying. This is a talk that realizes that this is a great audience, and I want to thank you all for being here. Many of you I know as friends, as recent friends, as longtime friends. This is important because what I'm sharing with you on the artifacts of Dogtown, the material objects that were left over, has never really been spoken to before. There's a great deal of research that's been done on the geography, many stories about the walks and the nature, but nothing, I mean literally nothing has been done about the material artifacts that were left. And so the fact is that they're all gathered at the Sandy Bay Historical Society, almost all of them, because there were things like belt buckles, shoe buckles, forks, knives, the kinds of things that people used on a daily basis. And just as someone might have gone and say, lend me a cup of sugar, they might say, I, I need a thimble to do some sewing. And these are inscrutable objects that don't have all the glamour and the glow of talking about spooks or spooky ghosts or strange stories. So I started when, when Jim Craig called me and said, could you give this talk? I went out and bought a very high-tech toy. You know, I love tech, and I love all the way that I can wake up in the middle of the night and write something here and something there, and I never look at it. So I went and bought a 1939 Underwood Universal typewriter from Cambridge Typewriter in Arlington, where the man had been there for 41 years. And you start to run into a very strange thing in talking about history and artifacts. 50 years ago is suddenly history. I mean, five minutes ago is history. So I bought this typewriter and I put paper in it. And any time I had something about Dogtown, I typed it. Now we are looking at an electronic presentation, but I started with it on the typewriter. Um, this is a quote. Again, this is what I've known over the past five years. I'm going to tell you how I started five years ago. I know that because I love granite and KPN is granite, that there was an affinity once I started to set my foot down and discover Dogtown and discover the complexity that there is. And the complexity is that this quote, let's see if I can do this. I can do this. Here, Bertie, hold these grindings in your fist and feed them in your craw. Fit them in this cup. Shiver of cold awe. Silence the girlish giggling's with a twist. Tom turned the cup and squinted long inside. This is from Percy Mackay's Dogtown Common, where the men have gone in and they want their fortune told. And Tammy, I think it's Tammy, says, take the coffee grinds down. You know, I remember as a kid, tea bags are being kept forever. Coffee grinds are being kept over and over and over to be used. And here she's saying, take it, put it in your mouth, get it wet, put it in the cup, and I'll tell the future. A real fortune telling from the old world taking place in Dogtown. So imagine that I've taken some coffee grinds and I'm stirring them a bit. I'm going to be moving around historically. What I said online, there were five things I was going to do. The opening of a cigar box of artifacts, they're over there. Yeah, I'll tell you the story of how I opened them, box from 1937. A video of digging at the very end. I want to share with you the only video, it's three minutes, of a young Edward Sperlin and Paul Sherman and Professor Frederick Norton actually digging in a cellar hole in Dogtown in 1965. 
paintings and graphics research, things that I found along the way that you maybe haven't seen. And a map over there, researched and drawn by Edward Sperlin. These are things you can look at after the talk is done. Okay. So this is a great uh, painting that I came across. It's a watercolor by Harriet Preston, who was a member of the Rockport Art Association. And she does it in 1954. It appeared in an article written by Elliot Rogers called A Botanist View of Dogtown. And what's amazing about it, it's called a ghost town, ghost village, is you can see in the upper right-hand corner, you do this. Ah, yes. Okay. An eagle. Nature in the landscape. It really, this is a landscape that could be almost anywhere. There is a witch flying on a broom. And then Tammy Young are leaning out, looking at the oxen cart. Yeah. Um, don't have the original painting. Have got the negative that Ann Fisk took in 1954 of this piece of work. And for me, it really does, it defines one of the key features of Dogtown, which is the push toward the, the spectacular story of witches and taking what might have been a very normal event of an oxen team driving on a road and embellishing it with a natural witchery and witch itself. I started to find things over five years, and one of the things I found was that in IT, see, we live on the perimeter of Dogtown, and we talk about going in, and we talk about what might happen to Dogtown. It's over there, it's inside. And yet, the first people, the, the people from the uplands before Dogtown Common had a clear open view down to the wharfs, down to the ocean to see was it safe to go fishing? Was it safe to leave the interior of Dogtown? Well, this is 1934. And looking at Dogtown is what the people of Annisquam were doing. And they were saying, you know, it'd be great to build a tennis court. Let's build some houses. And all the fears, Dogtown is a great reflective mirror for what the community needs at the moment. Think of it as really just being a mirror that reflects the needs and the arguments and the disagreements of the moment. Well, in 1934, bankers in Boston created the Dogtown Offer. This is all available through newspapers.com online. If you put in Dogtown, this is what comes up. And so they created an opera that was put on by the Cape Ann Follies at the Moreland Casino in 1934. And the general conceit is this. All of Dogtown has been sold for development. This is, think, of, think of what was in the air, the concern about what to do with all this. So in the opera, everything in Dogtown is sold except for three lots. Okay? There are different songs, and one of the songs is what a dump Dogtown is. Well, there's a, there's a real meaning to dump. Anyway, um, Act 2 is there are only three lots left. One is sold to an astronomer who is a friend of Albert Einstein. Second one is sold to, um, and this is a play, to someone who wants to build a hospital. And the third one, I think, is sold to someone musical. It all works out well in the end. It was a great excuse that the casino performances had a lot of chorus lines. People had a lot of fun, and it was a money raiser for the Anasquam Yacht Club. Uh, Along the way of five years, I took a few photographs because the first question five years ago is, well, where does Dogtown begin? Where does it end? It's not like the glacier came to the whale's jaw and said, okay, now I'm going to turn around and go back. This is the outside, if you're familiar with Pigeon Cove Harbor. On the outside of it, there's a very curious rock formation. It's only available at low tide. It's this kind of council of rocks. It's worn down. At high tide, it's completely obscured. You can't see it. And I, when I got down to photograph, I kind of poetically said, okay, the boulders got together and they said, all right, it's time for us to leave this island in the hands 
of people and of humans as stewards. So let's leave them these rocks that they can enjoy, the whale's jar, Peter's pulpit. Let's leave them this interior area that they can bark over and preserve and do their best to, to do what they think is right with it. So that's the Council of Boulders. I also went on the opposite side. I went to Peabody Mass, and I climbed in Centennial Park to Ship's Rock, which is, has a glacial erratic bigger than anything on KPM. And Ship's Rock was a, a spot where you could sit and look into Salem Harbor and watch the ships leave. And once the ship is left, the harbor, you were no longer a deserter and you were safe on shore. Um, I, I, I find Centennial Park to be a really important parallel for what could happen if we're not vigilant in Dogtown. Uh, it, it wanted to preserve open spaces. The rock is there. It's hard as heck to get to it. You have to go through all the industry. These are on the outside of Pijuco. Okay. So, you know, I'm as much talking to you as the son of a New England Congregationalist and a Greek Orthodox mother. What a combination that they married each other in 1947. But this is this was the house that my dad built. Cut the wood with his my grandfather, they planed it, they dried it, and he built the house. It's over here. All of these memories over the past five years, what Dogtown has provided for me is to really connect with what my childhood was like and how I can bring that into the present. So we would, vegetable gardens are a big thing. My mother would can, there were preserves, there were jams. And part of the vegetable garden was to harrow, turn the soil over and take the rocks out. So there would be a good space to be able to do the rows. Problem, I really see it right in there. There were rocks that simply were not going to be moved. They were too big. You know, we, we, we're making the hand row and you get to an ethel walk around and keep going. So I said, well, that's what the audience is like because you all have different experiences of Dogtown. Some more volatile, some more opinionated, some all different foundations from which you speak. You're all that bolder. And I've got to work with this. I've got to work around what you know. And the great thing about the boulder was you'd sit on it because it was warm. You'd have a jug of water on it. You're doing the rows for the beans. You'd sit there. It was there year after year after year. You know, I would wish for a similar stain decade after decade after decade for what we call Dogtown. There's also a great practical knowledge. One of the hard things with Dogtown is many of the practical ways that the farmers and fishermen who live there made it to work. You know, look at, I want to tell you a story. The first people in Dogtown, they were all younger than us. They were young people who come from the old world expecting big open pastures, farms to their glory of their eyes, and they run into Dogtown with a lot of rock. Well, my dad planted the trees up on the right, in here? Red pine. If you know red pine, it's not really worth much. It, the, the sound of they're just great. It's great for pine needle forts, and it's a windbreak to keep the fields open for pasturing. That was a really important detail. So when I walk through Dogtown, I look for tiny details. Okay, this is a great painting by Shal Hassan called The Top of Cape Ann. You know, at the very end, I, I'm going to share with you a poem that I found called Gammer Gaffer. It's a ballad of lost. Has anyone ever heard it, Gammer Gaffer? No. Okay. And it's a poem about a witch, but really what it is is, it's about an open moraine, an open terrain, where the nor'easter has come across the whole cape. Um, the only way I can equate it is there was one year in photographing at Halibut Point. You all know the overlook at Halibut Point? Well, it was blowing so hard I had to crawl out to the end to photograph. Could not stand up. The wind was just knocking me over. That's what these people had to face. They had to, and they had to make make sense out of the wind blowing through the trees and through the buildings. I have very few of my photographs. This was I decided minimal amount. 
but two that I'm especially fond of on the left is called the foundling, bo foundling boulder, foundling like a swaddling babe, because through Germany in the 1800s, they had the same preoccupation with stone and rock. It's like, did God put all these stones here? Was there a big storm that split them? You know, there was no um, understanding of glaciation. But what there was was that small boulders were called foundlings. Like that a lot. And then on the right, this is pretty much this time of the year where all the boulders retreat behind the cap briars and the ticks and the greenery. Yeah. Touch has been very important in my life. I'm a juggler. And so I love this image because the woman is touching the boulder. And it's a clear act. And I would invite any of you that go in and go on walks and take pictures in front of the boulders to stop and touch a boulder. There's temperature, there's a story, there's lots of stuff going on. This is from the 1890s, where there was barely any sense of a path. This is, there's only one photograph that I know of, of someone who lived in Togtown. And this is Sammy Stanley. There you go. Who, tradition-wise, was dressed by his grandmother as a girl and did washing in Dogtown. He leaves around 1840. He's one of the last people to leave Dogtown. He moves to Rockport, and first he takes in washing. And he becomes rich enough to dress, as you can see here, and... He becomes a stockholder in the Anasquan cotton mills. And the quote talks about Gilbert Tucker and Margeson, who was one of the founders of the Rockford Art Association. As a child, as a young man, going to Rockport and going to have his fortune told by Sammy Stanley. Because Sammy could really tell your fortune well. This is not Sammy Stanley. You know, there, there is acknowledgments and there's dedications and there are two people that I'm very mindful of who are not with us anymore. One is Gordon Gediman. Uh, I knew him very well. And when Gordon moved to Cape Ann, he did a great celebratory series of paintings called Celestial Island. There are, I think, 16 of them. They're all aerial, aerial views, and what's noteworthy was he never went up in the air. He just got the spirit of it. And this is one of the ones called Genesis, one of my favorites. And you've got Cape Ann down. It's just this, you know, the boulders offshore at Pigeon Cove saying, we need to leave something here for the humans to, to deal with. You know, and I think the chips have been called in on that. So Gordon, I miss very much tonight. So kudos to Dogtown Books for reassuring Peter Anastasis, a walker in the city. I've got poem at the beginning of the book from Charles Olson. So this is a poem by Charles Olson that's in the frontispiece of Peter Anastas's book called Lou's Love. If you who live here have not eyes to wish for that which gone cannot be brought back ever then again, you shall not even miss what you have lost. You'll only yourself be bereft in ignorance of what you haven't even known. I'm fond of that because things have fallen in my lap over these past five years of Dogtown. And it really started at this moment. In 2018, it was Dogtown Days, and it was... Friends of Dogtown, and it was at the Cape Ann Museum and walks and talks. And I was there. And in the audience was Peter Anastas. And I went up to him and I said, Peter, this is me. I said, April of 2018, we, the Sandy Bay Historical Society, had received the uh, research papers and artifacts of this high school kid named Eddie Sperland. I thought we were going to come back to it. I said, Peter, I've got 
all these things and all, and starting to bring them together, and I need to give a talk on it. And Lifter me said, nobody's done that. Please do that. And never got the chance to include him in the audience. This is the third time that I've attempted to talk about Dogtown artifacts. First time in 2018, it was for the San Diego Historical Society. Last fall, it was for the Bayless Society, where I brought out so many, I brought out more artifacts than there are people. I had the whole first floor, uh, the reception room at Sandy Bay filled. I'm much more modest tonight because Sperlin, the, the importance of having a local kid, I say kid, a 17-year-old high school kid in 1965, going into Dogtown over 130 times to dig out and so on, I said, how can this be? And it made more sense over time. It made sense because here's one of the unknown things that we don't even understand. For all the stories, all the books, all the disputes, there are two historical archives. And that's it for KPN regarding Dogtown. John James Babson, who writes the history of Gloucester, says a little about history of this. And the whole district was known by the appellation of Dogtown. I looked it up. Appalachian is a really fancy word, kind of moniker, what you're known to be by. You know, you can pick it out which, how, what the appeal is, what you are. That's all he says in the history of Gloucester. His friend, Ebenezer Poole of Rockport, who wrote nonstop, in the 1850s, I'll paraphrase this as well, there was a widow who came out from Dogtown, and she wanted to get some fish. And she went to the Gloucester Harbor, and she went to James Poole. And James Poole, getting ready to go out on his fishing vessel, says, yeah, Get out of here, you old witch. Just go away. She says, If you don't give me fish, something bad's going to happen. That's kind of an open-ended statement, you know. So he goes out, the anchor breaks, and uh, he comes back and he tells all the men, You better give her fish every time she comes down. That's it. All the rest are add-ons that have come. Oh, since that time in the 1850s. Because once Dogtown empties out, Gloucester kind of puts it aside. You know, it's 1840, plus Rockport is just uh, incorporated. It's a double double punch for Cape Ann. In 2018, uh, the talk with to Peter Anastas, again for Dogtown Days, my artist collaborator Susan Quaitman and I had gotten a uh, opportunity to present all the rocks we cannot see. see if that's, yeah. Thoreau in the changing landscape of Dogtown, where it was one visit, one walk, and one journal entry by Thoreau in August of, of 1858. We said, well, what would it be like in 200 years, in 2058? And when it comes to think of Dogtown, would it be preserved? Would it be forgotten? We were researching Richard Primack from MU, who had done a lot of research on plant growth and changes with climate change. There's none of that for Rockport. Nature has moved along in its own course. So we created, um, Susan did a silk painting, and we combined it with a photograph of this ghost of Thoreau moving through a landscape. Now there's an important element in this. Okay, we went out for a walk and showed what was being used as the cover at Thoreau Society. Very important detail. So Thoreau walks literally from Salem all the way down along the coast, through Manchester, along, and then into Dogtown Common. You know, in his journal, he talked about making mulberry tea, I believe, in the morning, or being able to smell it across the Cape. I bet you if I had a cup of tea here, no one in the back room would know what it would be smelling like. It have to be really strong. The, the point is this. What we're thinking of Dogtown, it was the whole top of Cape Ann and open. So, although we gave a talk at the Thoreau Society, okay, um, I became intrigued in the walking stick, which was Thoreau's most constant companion. He didn't like walking with people. He liked walking with his walking stick. 
and I gave a talk the next year on Thoreau's walking stick, the flywheel of imagination. And I went up to Mount Ann, and it took me a while, this is now four years old, to find a walking stick. And all I have to do is see how people kind of walk on the walking stick. And I realized putting it down could be one, two, And a great way of counting steps from one spot to another, I will confess, I'm trying to walk to Wales Trail and I haven't kept the steps. But this is an important detail because it slows you down, slowed me down in my walking. Thoreau's walking stick was his flywheel of his imagination. So I said, okay, Dogtown is a flypaper of our hopes and our love of nature. Uh, here's a great, you know, that we like then and, and nows. This is now in Dogtown, the marker for Cellar Hole 20. And that's what it was in the 1930s. You know. But then and now is really dangerous because you start to get sentimental about wanting to go back or not wanting to go back. Really none of that. It's to understand how the language and the way that we take the stories and even our own dialogue changes the very way that the landscape is experienced. So five years ago, I was obsessed with finding a chair. This is a newspaper article from 1930. And over here is a wonderful chair set from Dogtown. I said, oh, come on, how can this be? And I kept looking for it. I mean, I literally spent a year looking for this chair, only to realize that I'd been walking by it, I mean, this close, for six months. Now, yeah, it, you know, it's part of the problem with artifacts is you get into attribution. It's not like a Native American artifact that is of a certain depth and a geology that you can really date it. It really, well, these are, these are more modern things. I mean, how could this have come out of a cellar hole in Dogtown? Or when did it come out? Yep, the person who donated it, Elizabeth Rogers, was very credible. So, could be. Um, look. 2018, um, I said, why do people settle for Dogtown? Why take a piece? Of, yeah, why take a piece of the pie? It was the heart of Cape Ann. I'm still trying on, on New Year's Eve to get an oxen heart to cook. It's not an easy thing to find. But I would say, take the heart out, throw it on the ground, and watch the dogs come. And they each take a piece. And they say, this is my Dogtown not yours. This is my dog town, not yours. And to the death, they defend it. Praise be. This is the Aesop's fable, where the oxen comes in from the field, very hungry. The meal is there, and the dog doesn't want to let him by. The medieval heart, the cardio political heart, from which the center of all business and all life flowed, is what Dogtown was. Charles Mann's book is called In the Heart of Cape Ann, one of the first references. So I became obsessed with how do I find things to begin with? If you go to my website, uh, In the Heart, no, In the Heart of Cape Ann, I did five Zoom videos a year ago on Dogtown. And unboxing the cigar box, which is over here, it had been, it had been nailed shut since 1937 and kind of just moved along and shoveled along. So as with anything, I said, I'm going to open up this box and see what it looks like. And it was, is this in? I didn't, okay. So it's over here, it was filled with shards. The problem with Dogtown artifacts is it was always an amateur occupation. You know, we pack our lunch, go up on Sundays with an ice cream bag and put some stuff in from cellar hole, whatever and leave it on the door of the museum. And that was it. And time passed, and sometimes things were looked at, sometimes they weren't. How are we doing here? Oof, okay. Um, remember I talked about the dump, what a dump dog town is? This is Colonel Pierce's dump. Not his cellar hole, but I grew up with the dump. You know, I, last week talking, someone said, well, we all have dumps in our backyard, and we dig and we find this, we find that. My point is the dump was history. We go up in the woods and we just drop the organics and the metals off. 
And we could see stuff from 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago that was still there. So it's very rare for someone to have found animal bones like Colonel Pierce had in his dump. So there were three major collectors of dog town artifacts. Professor Norton, who was at MIT as a professor of ceramics, lived in Anasquam, collected a lot of the, red, the red, redware shards that we see. Um, spoke in the area, spoke at the Sandy Bay Historical Society. Uh, he never really cataloged how he did his digging. Hey, here, yeah, wow, indeed. Problem was, over time, it just became another bunch of objects. And this was um, a drawer full of shards that I found that had been on exhibit by Frederick Norton. And then I'll just jump into a thing. It took me a month to separate them out to be able to say, okay, this is the one from this cellar hole. Why? Because they tell a story. In 1992, Irving Sujalecki, who was a research chemist, came out from MIT in his spare time and ended up publishing a book called A Return to Dog Turn. And he did, oh, this is an example of one of the pages where all the pieces here are what he gathered. Problem is, don't know what cellar it was from. We have a lot of tags, a lot of stuff that's not coordinated. I thought he was 90 years old, right? Well, he's 59, and I met him last fall. He came out from Winchester, and he bought from Cellar Hole S, Stanwood Cellar Hole, um, two boxes of artifacts that he had uncovered and put together in 1992, and they hadn't been opened since then. He expressed dismay over the fact that no one wanted the books to be published and nobody cared. Here they are. How? And now we get to Edward Sperlin. Edward Sperlin on the left at the age of 17, over here along with Paul Sherman, go repeatedly up into Dogtown. Um, Eddie really felt they should rebuild one of the houses to show what it looked like. I couldn't believe it when we got all his materials and his research materials. I said, how can a high school kid have this kind of acumen? Well, he was in fact mentored by Frederick Norton, who was quite elder at that time. Huh. Paul Sherman, who went on to become interested in uh, shipwrecks around Cape Band, loved buttons. And he had a, his aunt was a member of the Massachusetts State Button Society. So he, as a, as a high school kid, drew very accurate front and backs of the buttons to send to her so she could give her opinion of them. She wrote back to him and tried to con him out of a couple of the buttons, which she didn't. Buttons are over here. Um, again, the shoujo, the material things, the last bone buttons, metal buttons, um, coins. So the significance of, of Edward Sperlin now in 2023 is that most of the literature and the concern speaks of Dogtown Common. I've become aware that the previous time of the uplands of Cape Ann, which was from late 1600s to 1740, 1750, had a different population and a different purpose. And Sperlin digs into this. This is a uh, two and a half inch pewter sundial, which is the drawing of the map that Sperlin does, scale showing coin and sundial. Well, he wonders in his research papers, don't know who this is. Then he says, we think it's Joseph Miller. Well, Joseph Miller, Josiah Miller, the Miller family was from Rhode Island. They were tinkers. They made button molds, they made buttons, they made belt buckles, and especially they made pewter sundials. So that started to raise a question. How did these tinkers move through that land, through that language? Um, it was young families. How did they do it? The language is unknown. Here's the backside of the uh, pewter sundial, which is over here. So this is 1750. And this is um, Eddie's database in, the, in 1965. And down here, number 20, is the uh, Josiah Miller, uh, excuse me, this is down here, sundial. Size, late 1600s, supposed to be 1750s. 
So it indicates he was had a really great methodology and behavior. Eddie, after doing all of this, leaves Dogtown and becomes very re re religiously committed for the rest of his life. I'm convinced that he was sitting in the back of everyone with some of my talks, but then I look out now and I think I see everybody that I know sitting here. Eddie Sperlin, one of the neat things, and it's here, is he created and researched a map that was published by the San Diego Bay Historical Society. All of these things came to me. I was doing a talk in 2019, and Pierce Sears came up and said, let me give you this map. You need to have it. Eddie worked for him at Twin Lights Soda. Um, this is the most extraordinary thing. This is a the wedding band of Joseph Ingersoll from 1707, sitting over in the cabinet. So this makes it a very old artifact um, to think about, and from it's inscribed. In the research manual, Eddie Sperling says, you know, this was um, found in the cellar hole between brick and, and plaster by this man in Riverdale who gave it to me. You know, all of this is attributed, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. The full story is this. Sears says San Diego Historical Society in the water. Eddie had a display at the San Diego Bay Historical Society in 1965. Some of the things that he had remained with the museum. This he took home, which is in Milford, New Hampshire. So his widow brings all the materials to San Diego Bay, and the last page of the journal says, Wedding Rangeland, we think this is great. A letter comes a month later from his widow saying, I was vacuuming under the couch and I found this ring and I think it belongs there. It's not the end of the story. So in 2019, I included it in the exhibit. And then for three years, I can't find the ring. I mean, I can't find it anywhere. And I'm more than quietly heartbroken. And finally, I open up his research book and right with the page, I put it there. Um, then I realized, oh my gosh, he took it home. This is the end of the story. When I gave the talk last fall, his son, Jason, emailed me saying, we grew up with all this stuff on dad's bookshelf, and we didn't think it was going to be of any use. Thank you so much for bringing it back to life. So it's, it, and so the answer is, I pull these two or three things out. There's more. Um, there's there are some arrowheads. There are some Native American artifacts that I shared with Muriel and Lepianca. Um, one of the neat things is to see handmade bricks with clamshell mortar. Okay, that's all significant. Here's the ring. Yeah. So, a couple of controversial things we'll end on. In, of course, you know, Roger Babson is the watershed and the boulders. But in 1907, this very curious thing takes place. Understand, this this just came by hanging out at the museum. It's it's not like I went looking for it. It landed in my lap. It was the Cape Ann Therapeutorion at Wales Draw Park. I want to hear the sales pitch. I'm a member of the Gloucester Hospital Society, and I want to sell you on the latest thing that we're doing. We're going to franchise a health spa up in the middle of Dogtown at Wales Draw. You know, Kellogg at Battle Creek and American sanitariums are the rage everywhere. And we want to make a health spa where people can come. The weather is great in the fall. It's great in the summer. You're going to love it, except it's not for you. You can give us $10 for uh, a share, and they sold $100,000 worth of shares. It was built for these steamships to come into New York and Boston and for pe wealthy people from Europe to come in and extol them. It makes sense. This is the brochure. They even had, it's, it's, it's 20 inches by five feet, fold out gateway of the buildings that were going to be built in Dogtown. It, it's supported by the locals, but not for locals' use. And the only reason it didn't work is because the steamship stopped with World War I. Took care of it. It's a curious thing on the internet. You go and you look for it. And all I've been able to find is um, two or three documents that relate to franchises and franchise fees in Massachusetts. And it folds after 1917. It has Babson's stamp behind it. 
Okay, it's the way it worked. I can't make an affirmative stand. I would love to find a list of the board of directors from the Gloucester City Hospital. I haven't been able to find that as yet, but it's a curious fact. So the whole conceit of witches in Dogtown and the unknown of Dogtown codifies in 1919 when Harper's Monthly publishes an article by an artist who's taking a tour from Salem down through Cape Ann, ticking off the witches along the way. And this is an artist rendering from 1919 of what Dogtown would have looked like in the 1700s. Key thing here I want to bring your attention to are the two boys and the girl behind the boulder. Because that, that's a real artistic conceit or a cameo of like, what are they doing? Are they really hearing you? This is 1919. Um, I'm really happy about this. I still look at when's the first time the word Dogtown was used? When's the first time the whale's jaw was used? What's the first illustration? This is the same type of cameo from 1851. And this is in Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion, which was a broadside newspaper. And in it, only because I was looking at a slide that referenced this, here is Dogtown in 1851. What's going on? Well, it's wide open. Okay. You've got commerce going by. Are they tinkers? What are they? They're moving through. And you've got summer visitors coming in. A really interesting combination. In the same issue, there's the first article on Dogtown that I've come across. It's written by Francis Alexander Dorovage, who is known as the Olden. He wrote very satirical articles for the Atlantic Monthly. And he writes, get this, the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorkshire. It's a reenactment. It's where the militia come out. He opens by saying, it was a great day for the citizens of Dogtown, decked out in blue. And he talks satirically about people being dressed. And then the people of Hardscrabble, who are representing the side of Cornwallis. And I say, okay, Dogtown is Gloucester and Hardscrabble. One of the names of Rockport was going to be Hardscrabble. So it must be that. Um, it's a funny piece because he's poking fun at the people. And, of course, officially, Cornwallis surrenders. Except in this particular story, Cornwallis didn't like the guy in Dogtown, and so he refused to surrender and beat him down. Yeah. But that's Duravage in 1846's So I came to Pigeon Cove, uh, and I happened upon Dogtown that was left to the dignity of witches. This is a piece for all the naturalists in the house. It's from Barbara Urkel's Village at Wayne's Cove. Think of the cape being totally denuded. And she says, you know, in the really big February winter storms, the ocean scud, which were like the beach fleas, would be blown all the way into the middle of Dogtown. Well, Cat Briar won't give them that kind of chance right now. Okay. Camera gaffer. I guess it's okay, yeah. 655. So I came across this poem. Part of the attraction of Dogtown. It's written by Merritt Madison Julius Cowain, who was known as the Keats of Kentucky because he lived in Kentucky and he wrote poems like he was from England. So this is actually a poem, I imagine, this is a poem about an incredible nor'easter blowing across the Cape. And what do you do when you're living in the middle of it, okay? Gammer, by the way, is a, is a colloquialism for grandmother. Gammer Gaffer, a ballad of Gloucester. One night, when trees were tumbled down and wild winds shook at sea the sail, old Gammer Gaffer, lean and brown, chuckled and whistled on her nail, toothing, then seized her broom and mounting it, flew up the chimney with her cat, all Dogtown bade to see her flit, the screech owl shrieked, and lightning lit about her head flew black a bat. Old shutters clapped and windows rapped, and shingles shook as if in pain. Her bosom, bosom on each old door slapped and flapped as cloaked and conical capped, 
whisked by old Gammer Gaffin's train. I'm skipping a few here for you, to give you the idea. Okay. So round and round the old Cape Town she whirled and whined as winds the wind. Now this way blew her rag of gown, now that way through the blackness blind, and as she went she crowed and croaked, and crooned some snatch of devil's verse, while now and then her cat she stroked, and in a wink all capped and cloaked, flew back to Dogtown with a curse. Okay, we're going to end with a video. All right, so this is, um, let me see if I can, do you think I can start it, Jim? Let me try just to give you the setup on this, in meeting Pierce Sears, we started to talk more. After giving me the map, I came to his house, and he explained that he always had a 60-millimeter 60, 60 camera with him when he went out, and he photographed everything. He said, I think I've got some stuff for Dogtown. So this is um, a short video on uh, Edward Sperlin on the left or the right with Paul Sherman, and in the middle is Frederick Norton who mentored Edward. Okay, and so this is the only video that we have of any kind of a dig in Dogtown, and it's amateur. Okay, you can find it. Okay. Good. We've killed the audio because I'm just saying this is amazing, this is great. You know, this is a real amateur dig. But it's the way it was. That's Frederick Norton. That's Eddie. And we're going to see some of the boulders. And what the great thing is the uh, openness around the boulders. This is actually Colonel Pierce's water hold. It's, it's amazing to look back and see slides of people walking back in the 50s and 60s to see what is similar and what's dissimilar. Yeah, so there's, they've just simply dug all the dirt out from a cellar hold, and they're kind of now just going through the pile, right? It's why I think things like the ring and the sundial are kind of unique. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So, um, I believe that's the last piece, yes. This has gone on for a little while. I really thank you. Are there any quick questions? And then, you know, those who want to take a look at the artifacts, they can. Yeah. You know, that's great. R Russell was talking about walking up uh, and seeing a, a rock painted white that you would take a left to to go down and get spring water. Um, I mean, there's so many other things. There's a great poem from the 1880s called Going Burying, where it's about young people going up to pick blueberries and speculating on what they're going to be like as adults. Okay? And, you know, just the fact of kids going up to pick berries, either for themselves or for summer visitors, is a, a, a part of life that we no longer see or have. Barbara Urkula in the 60s put out a call for all the Finns who had lived in Lanesville and she got a reply back from a woman who drove this great map of the trolley line around the Cape. But in the middle of it was a little picture of the dog town. And she said, as a kid, I would go up there to get the berries to sell them to the summer people, and I never knew what I had. I want to say one more thing. I want to say about the word V. We talk now about walking and going to see whale's jaw. 
We're going to go see Peter's Pulpit. I'm going to walk from point A to point B. But for a long time, it was always referred to as the whale's jaw, the Peter's Pulpit. And I think one of the things behind this is this standing in the middle and looking out at a scene with the audience of Cape Man versus simply being out here with my apps and my ways of walking and I'm going by this point. It's why the touch of the rock is so important. That's all I have. I think that's all I have to say. Yes, hi. So the question is, why was it settled first and why was it abandoned? Well, that we now get into this difference between the farmers of the upland and their movement away. In a nutshell, I mean, people are coming from Europe with the idea of making a living. And they're not bankers, they're farmers and they're fishermen. The farmers came expecting big areas of open pasture. Coastal areas pretty much taken up by early fishing. They go into Dogtown, which is like a hard sell. You know, I mean, I've seen an article from 1880 with the person who's going to look for the pitcher plant. And she says, my husband and I were able to go from boulder to boulder for over a mile without ever putting our feet down on pasture. Hmm? So they have this tremendous difficulty and struggle. It's why Charles Olson, apart from the Maximus Dogtown poem, says, look, my problem is how to explain to you about those people who were there before, who were farmers and fishermen, da, 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 da. And he had no answers. Not that I have an answer, but I have an understanding a little bit that when the wealthy people of Dogtown were very enough for them in the 1730s, they staged a coup. And the coup was, they went to the city of Gloucester and said, we will build a church on Middle Street where the Jewish temple is now. We'll do this. We'll recoup our cost by selling pews because where you were in the pew was your status and your economic and political wealth. Not just on Cape Ann, it was, it was done everywhere. The curious fact is that the proposal by the wealthy is in the Gloucester City Archives and in the records. I said, beautiful handwriting. What's not there are the petitions from the people and dogs in the city. We can't go an extra mile and a half. We don't have the horses. We don't have the wagons. We can't do that. And it takes eight or nine years for this to be adjudicated where the wealthy went out. All of those documents related to the petitions of the people who were still living in Dogtown left Cape Ann. They're in the Mass State Archives. They are, Irving Sujalecki found them in the 90s. I got photostatic copies of them. So it's not a surprise that, you know, the artifacts say, screw you, Gloucester, we're going somewhere else in it. Um, and that enabled then, with the wealthy moving down, you know, look, the story is that when people went to church from dog time, they walked barefoot because they only had one pair of shoes. They put the shoes on when they went into church. And so that extra distance and the pews made it impossible, and it made it possible, this is my view, for the wealthy to, you know, establish slumlord capabilities. It sounds dire. Now, so if you remember now, there are only two historical pieces of archives, one from Babson, one from Poole. The, the, the narrative, the, the strict narrative of how Dogtown has been treated by Gloucester, I think it's this cold shiver of awe that that Dogtown will reflect back what the community needs and what each part wants to see. Well, it's, it's I'm honored to be able to be here and have this be a part of the Gloucester 400 events as well. Um, I am doing a public walk, like I'm doing a walk for Gloucester 400 on June 17th, and there is a um, RSVP. I want to try to cap it at 20 people <laughs> for that and more to continue, but those are the immediate things. See, that's that's the thing. I mean, there is this fascination of the family and the genealogies and the connections. The artifacts are, are more elusive to be able to make a connection to. Um, but any other questions? No, I'm just gonna hang out over here. Thank you.